Um, thank you for coming to our um, Fiscal Responsibility Forum. Um, my name is Colette Wilson. I am the current chair of the Virginia Society of CPAs. Um, I can relate to this topic, although I'm glad that I'm not on the panel. Um, I'm a former partner with Cotton & Company where um, I dedicated my career to doing audit and accounting services for the federal government. So fiscal responsibility is something I'm very familiar with. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. I am here to introduce our panel and your moderator and then turn it over to them. Um, for anyone who did not get them, there are handouts at the front, at the, I mean at the back where you first came in. Also, if you're not a part of the conference, the professional development conference that the VSCPA is putting on, make sure you see either David Bass in the back or Emily Walker in the back to make sure that you can get your CPE credits for this session. And then the best part is after the forum, um, the society is inviting you to the bar for appetizers afterwards for continued discussion. So it's a Thursday evening at 7 p.m. and we're here discussing fiscal responsibility and, and why are you here. And I would say because this is a very relevant, continuous problem, issue, concern that's facing our state, our economy, our profession, and our nation at large. Um, and these things are coming back down to Virginia in specifically. So that's why the Virginia Society has decided to put this forum on. Also, fiscal responsibility is very important um, in terms of what we need to do as a society to address it. And so the society has actually developed a philosophy as it relates specifically to government fiscal responsibility. And that philosophy is based on sustainability, stewardship, and transparency. Those are things that we are looking forward to and looking at when we are educating our members and advising the public and lawmakers. So let me introduce our panel, very esteemed panel that we have. First, there is Scott Bell, MBA and CGFM, is a senior staff accountant at the U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Fiscal Assistant Secretary, where he is among a team that's responsible for putting together the report of the U.S. government and the accompanying citizen guide. That's no easy feat. He is the Treasury's staff liaison to the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Board and a featured speaker, both in the U.S. and abroad, on fiscal position and um, the condition of the federal government. Scott's career in the federal financial management area spans more than 20 years where he's had other positions at OMB, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Small Business Administration. Scott has served as the president of the Washington, D.C. chapter, vice president of the Capital Region, and is currently the senior vice president at the Association of Government Accountants. Next, we have Emily Edwards. She's a director of the Government Performance Task Force of the U.S. Senate Budget Committee, where she supports Senator Mark Warren as the chairman. Prior to her current post, she was a manager of the Government Performance Project at the Pew Center on the States, where she could produce the 50-state management card. Previously, Aunt Amy served as the Senior Director of Leadership and Performance at the Council for Excellence in Government and the Communic Communications Director, excuse me, for Harvard's Innovations in American Government Award. Our next panel person is Ed Mazur, CPA and MBA. He is a senior advisor for public sector services with Clifton Larson Allen LLP. He served four governors as state controller for the Commonwealth of Virginia between 1980 and 91, at which time he also served as president for the National Association of State Auditors, Controllers, and Treasurers. In 1991, he was confirmed by the Senate to be the first controller appointed under the Chief Financial Officers Act through which he headed OMB's Office of Federal Financial Management. He also served on the Government Accounting Standards Board for 10 years. He currently serves as the chair of the SBA's Audit and Financial Management Advisory Committee and as a member of the Association of Government Accountants Financial Management Standards Board. Last, not least, we have Tim Fisoski, CPA. He is a past chair of the Virginia Society of CPAs and is a member and is a former member of the Governing Council of the AICPA. In the Virginia Society's recent Disclosures magazine, he actually authored the article that was entitled, If the Government Were a Corporation, A Fiscally Unsustainable Federal Government Threatens Our Nation and Every American. Our panel will be led by tonight's moderator, Jeff Thiebert. Jeff is a manager of state fiscal health and economic growth at the Pew Charitable Trust. And at that trust, there are projects that seek the, to strengthen the state's fin financial planning, budget, and use of tax incentives. He works with a team of researchers and journalists and consultants to provide states with evidence-based tools 
that they need to improve their economic climates and long-term vitality. Before joining Pew, Jeff worked for the Concord Coalition as a national grassroots director and the Northeast Regional Director. He also served as an associate for the law firm of Masterman and Graham, where he practiced law in trial and appellate courts for Virginia. With that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. How is everybody doing this evening? Great. Um, we have a great panel tonight, so I'm actually going to step aside and let's get started. What we'll do, the evening will be structured. We'll do four presentations, then we'll open it up to a discussion, and then we want to hear your questions. So after we've uh, gone through a few minutes of discussion, if people have questions, please raise your hand and hope to have a very interactive session with all of you tonight. So with that, Scott, would you like to kick us off? Absolutely. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming this evening, and thank you to, uh, let's see, I got David and Colette and Emily. Thank you all, and, and to the Virginia Society for having me out this evening. I'm very pleased and honored to be joining uh, my panel colleagues and to be speaking to you uh, this evening. I think we're going to have a very interesting time this evening, uh, to say the least. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to just ask, uh, first of all, there are copies of the Citizen's Guide to the Financial Report of the U.S. Government on the table in the back if you didn't get, one, didn't get one already. By show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the Financial Report of the U.S. Government and or the Citizen's Guide? Excellent. <laughs> so that's going to be another good 20 or so uh, subscribers that, uh, that we'll have by the time this evening is done. So that's, uh, that's good news to start with. Um, what I typically like to do, I speak to a number of audiences. Whoops, that's not right. There we go. F5. There we go. Um, I typically like to start my presentations with a little quote uh, from our, one of our founding fathers that I think speaks to what we're trying to accomplish at the Treasury Department uh, with this financial report. Um, we might hope to see the finances of the Union as clear and intelligible as a merchant's book so that every member of Congress and every man of any mind in the Union should be able to comprehend them to investigate abuses and consequently to control them. And that is really what, uh, at its essence, what we're trying to do. You know, the big trend uh, right now is with transparency, and uh, Amy's going to speak to that later. Um, but this is kind of a start in that direction, is a document that is uh, designed for the general public to give a sense of the financial position and condition of the U.S. government. And that's largely what I'm going to be speaking from this evening. There's really two types of information that we uh, present in the document, uh, really both at the Financial Report and the Citizen's Guide. One is uh, kind of your more traditional revenues and costs and balance sheets and the like, uh, so it should look very familiar. Uh, the second type of information, we, we call it non-traditional, and it's really going to be the emphasis of my uh, brief remarks for you uh, this evening. And you'll see that when we get to it. So first, a very quick trip through uh, the financial information, not even a trip, just a very uh, stop along the, the highway here. Uh, these are four charts that you will see in the Citizen's Guide, uh, and they kind of speak to this traditional type of reporting that I spoke about uh, uh, just a minute ago. You've got a look in the top left at, our, at the deficit and net cost of the federal government, deficit being on a cash basis and net cost on, a, on an accrual basis. I'm sure you all are all familiar with uh, the difference there. Uh, chart two on the upper right-hand corner is uh, the government's revenues over the past five years, broken down by major category. Uh, chart three in the bottom left is a, is a, uh, shows the contribution of uh, the various agencies. It shows the various agencies how they contribute to the government's net cost of about $3.7 trillion this past year. And then in the bottom right is a graphical representation of the government's balance sheet. The government's balance sheet. <clears throat> um, and I will touch on this very briefly because it does kind of segue into the start of what I'll talk about in terms of the government's non-traditional reporting. You will see on the liability side, uh, the major categories there are federal debt securities held by the public of about $12 trillion. Uh, and then there's another, the, the other major category is federal employee and veterans benefits payable. That's kind of the pension liability for the 
uh, federal employees and the veterans and so on. And then another category of uh, about $1.3 trillion. Is, is there anything that folks might expect to see there on the liability side that is not there? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I, I heard it. Social Security. Uh, obligations under Social Security, obligations under Medicare. That is correct. Uh, under federal accounting rules, uh, the, the long-term obligations under, so under for Social Security and Medicare, what we call social insurance programs, does not meet the technical definition of a liability for any number of reasons. Um, and this is where we get into this kind of non-traditional reporting. The Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board uh, debated this issue for many years, um, the, the, the fact or the, the issue of whether it should or should not be a liability. And finally, as I mentioned, they kind of came up with the determination, no, it does not meet the technical definition of a liability, um, uh, for, for, again, for any number of reasons. One being, uh, what would you show as an asset to, to counter that liability? Uh, are we looking at deferred revenues? Um, another example would be, the nature of those liabilities can change um, really uh, 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 year to year. Everyone gets their Social Security statement every year, right? Well, there's some fine print there that says, basically, uh, these benefits can be changed, basically, with the stroke of a pen. Uh, so what the board decided to do was, uh, since, although it doesn't meet the technical definition of a liability, they did say it is a significant exposure of the federal government, so we need to report on it, communicate, on it, communicate about it somehow in the financial report. So they created what's known as the Statement of Social Insurance, and that's the table at the top of this slide. And what you will see here is uh, the government's uh, net present value, uh, the net present value of these programs, uh, projected expenditures, net of the projected receipts, over 75 years. Why 75 years? That's the time frame that the Social Security and Medicare programs use in preparing the trustees' reports. And so what you are going to see there in very brief fashion is that over 75 years, the net present value is an excess of expenditures over receipts of roughly $40 trillion. Okay? That's a net present value figure for 2013. Uh, we are, even though we are past the end of the fiscal year for 2014, we are in the process of preparing the report as we speak. So we are still looking at the last effective report, which is for uh, the, pe the previous fiscal year, 2013. Um, so that's quite a telling number. Uh, the, the board basically took a look at this information and kind of taking it to the next level said, well, this is a very important communication of the exposures with respect to these particular programs. We should perhaps consider widening the lens and taking a look at not just social insurance activity, uh, social insurance flows, but um, the activity of the whole federal government. So that is what we are getting into when we talk about the long-term fiscal projections or otherwise known as long-term, or I'm sorry, fiscal sustainability. How do we define fiscal sustainability in the government? Well, there's any number of ways to view sustainability in whatever type of reporting you're doing. There's environmental sustainability. There's economic sustainability. For the purposes of this analysis, if you go to the uh, federal accounting standard that underlies these analyses, it basically says that a sustainable condition is one where your debt as a percent of gross domestic product remains stable or, is in, or declines over the long term. So let's take a look at first the chart on the left. What we're looking at here is the government's, uh, the colored region there is the government's uh, historical, I think back to 1980, and projected expenditures. That's the colored region by major category. You've got Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Defense, and other. And compared with the heavy black line, which is receipts. Um, what you're going to say, so when you are looking at, when you're limiting your analysis to those pieces, you're looking at basically the government's primary balance. And what that is showing there is, uh, you can kind of see where there is a brief period right about here where <clears throat> your receipts exceed your total program spending. That's what's known as a primary surplus. 
Uh, that's actually the projection period that we're just about in right now. What's that from? We're, well, we've seen in, uh, in over the past year legislation passed that increased revenues. Uh, you're seeing uh, uh, effects of the sequester on the, on the spending side, the Budget Control Act. So uh, as of last year, the projection was actually that over a fairly short amount of time, you'd actually see a little bit of what's called a primary surplus. Now, the long-term effects, though, once the uh, uh, once basically the Budget Control Act period, sequester period, ends in about 10 years, that's where you get coming back into the equation the long-term effects of uh, the baby boom generation retiring uh, and uh, medical costs. Kind of drives us back into a primary deficit condition. So uh, how do you fund a deficit? How does the government fund its deficit? It issues debt, right? So, uh, and with debt along comes interest, and so what you have uh, there on top of the program uh, balance that I talk, just talked about is the effect of interest spending, and that's where you get kind of this light blue line uh, giving you kind of the total spending equation there, where, and so you can kind of see the, you're, going, you're now building from a program deficit to uh, a unified deficit uh, condition there that we're, that we're projecting. Uh, if you go to the chart on the right, uh, what you'll see is basically it's the same as the chart on the left. We've taken the colors away, and we have overlaid on top of that chart the historical and projected debt as a percent of GDP. Uh, and it's a bit of a complex chart. You have to look at the right-hand uh, axis to kind of get the scale for the debt to GDP. Um, but basically what you see is, tracking along with the effects that you see in the chart on the left, kind of a flat line of uh, the debt to GDP over the next 10 years, and then kind of a, a, a progressive escalation uh, in the out years. Now, there's a couple things that I should mention that you have to keep in mind with respect to really this entire analysis, social insurance and the sustainability. Uh, one is that uh, this is based on current law and policy. Okay, so it is not anticipating any future change um, in the legal landscape, policy landscape, is drawing a line in the sand and extrapolating uh, current, current trends out mathematically into the future, okay? That's very important. As a result, what we're looking at here are absolutely not predictions. They are simply projections meant to start a conversation. It is meant to show if nothing were done, over the short term, long term, medium term. This is a, a potential uh, trend that we could, could be on. Along with, this, uh, along with these charts that you'll see uh, in the Citizen's Guide uh, comes a, a couple of pretty stark statements. We actually say uh, in the Citizen's Report and in the Guide, well, uh, well actually, let me ask you the first uh, this question. So the debt to GDP chart, the debt to GDP trend that we see there, Based on the definition of sustainability that I talked about before, what is your conclusion as to whether that debt to GDP trajectory is, uh, translates into a sustainable path for the government? Yes or no? It's okay, you can say it. <laughs> Correct. And we actually say in the financial report and in the citizen's guide, based on this analysis, one would conclude that this is an un a fiscally unsustainable path. But we also say on the flip side, that the sooner changes are made, be they revenue changes, uh, expenditure changes, some combination of both, that the sooner those kind of changes are put in place, the less dramatic those changes would have to be. Now, we're already seeing, I would say, some moderately decent news here even in the short term. Just about a week ago, the Treasury Department and OMB jointly released the results of uh, the government's uh, deficit for the past year. Uh, it, it still seems like a lot, and it is, $483 billion is the deficit for the past year. That's down from uh, about $680 billion, I believe, from the previous year. Uh, it is the lowest deficit level since before the, fiscal cr the financial crisis, and it's the uh, lowest deficit as a percent of GDP since, uh, I believe, over, it's, the low it's lower than the average over the past 40 years. So some some positive news at least. With that, I want to leave you with this quote 
uh, from John Kennedy. To state the facts frankly is not to despair the future nor indict the past. The prudent heir takes careful inventory of his legacies and gives a faithful accounting to those whom he owes an obligation of trust. My intention here this evening was not to have you walk out of here despairing the future or indicting the past. Uh, it's simply to provide you with some uh, information that I would hope that you would take back and use and ask us about this evening and take back and talk about with your friends and your colleagues and, and, uh, and use it in your own as, as you will. So those are my remarks and I will now turn it over to Ed. Society for uh, sponsoring this, okay. and I very appreciate that all of you uh, came tonight. And I hope that it will be helpful to you. I had the pleasure uh, a bit over a year ago of participating. Okay. Go ahead. I had the ple pleasure uh, a, a little over a year ago of participating in a, a very similar forum down in Richmond, and one of my co-panelists was a economics uh, professor uh, at one of our area colleges and you know he he became so excited uh, as a result of, of the forum and the exchange with the audience that he decided to challenge the uh, uh, House uh, Majority Leader Eric Cantor for his post and by gosh as you all know he won. So <coughs> we don't know what's going to happen because of tonight. We'll see. I want to talk about the implications uh, that are there about the information. Hmm. Excuse me. Suddenly I'm getting a <coughs> dry throat. Um, the implications of the information that Scott just shared with you. I've been concerned about this since uh, the mid 70s, the debt of the federal government. <coughs> I've done active research on it for over 10 years. I've been publishing and speaking on the subject for. Uh, the last five years. I want to give a brief summary comment on what Scott just said, if you will, from an old state controller's perspective. If you look at the uh, 2013 column, you'll see the total debt. That's what you hear economists and uh, politicians and so forth speaking about, the, the 12 trillion that's publicly owned. We, we probably all of us own a little bit of that in some way. Next are the federal employee and VA benefits, the unfunded portion. That's uh, $6.5 trillion. There's the other that was also on Scott's slide. And then there's what the Treasury owes back to the Social Security and Medicare trust funds. And as an aside, the Social Security Disability Trust Fund runs out of trust fund money in 2016, and the benefits will be cut accordingly under law, just FYI. And then you pick up the unfunded present value of the social insurance programs. And when you add that all up, you get to $64.4 trillion. Below that number, the 16 trillion, that's the size of our economy. So when you hear folks, economists particularly, in, 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 in case you, it won't be clear, I, I don't like economists <laughs> at all. I think they've led us astray. But if you take the relationship between the 64 trillion and, and the, the economy, this uh, indebtedness, this, op, this cumulative obligation and indebtedness is 400% of GDP. It's not the 70 or so percent or 75% uh, of GDP. Remember, at the, uh, you hear people say at the end of World War II it was 109% because we had gone to war and built up all that debt and therefore we still have a ways to go. But in those days they didn't have Medicare. They didn't have the Social Security obligations they have. They didn't have the unfunded uh, public debt, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we have a very dire situation. And how dire is it? That level, that 64 trillion of uh, unfunded obligations and debt is equivalent to 96% of the total net household net worth of the entire nation. That's all your net worth, Bill Gates' net worth, 
add it all together. So I'm going to state very boldly and without any fear of contradiction that the United States government, our federal government, will never, ever, ever be able to meet those obligations. And therefore, that has tremendous implications for each of you, children, grandchildren, and for the state and local governments. What is intergovernmental financial dependency? It's the fact that monies flow by choice of policy and legislative action from one level of government to another, federal government to states, state to local governments. And in addition, and this is something that often gets no attention, within jurisdictions, be they local government or state, there are the activities of other governments going on that add to the economic uh, situation of those jurisdictions. So what are the key measures that we can look to that help identify how much our states and, and uh, their local governments are reliant on the federal government? There are four columns, or three columns here. If you look at the middle column, that's Virginia. Uh, it receives $13.5 trillion uh, billion dollars, uh, in 2012, and this is, this is the latest information that's available to us. And that represented 27% of all of the tax money and all the other monies that, that Virginia has taken in, including that that comes into its universities in, in a way of tuition and fees and so forth. 27%. The average for the U.S. is 35%. I, I hesitate to tell you, or don't hesitate to tell you, that there aren't many people who, who are consciously aware of that dependency. Uh, when you add to that the $1.5 billion that flows directly from the federal government to the local governments for education and social, and, uh, uh, social services in the main, to the 55 billion dollars that has been spent in Virginia among Virginia businesses by the federal government. And then you have $62.8 billion that the federal government disperses to uh, fed, federal employees, military and civilian, federal uh, military and civilian retirees, to social uh, uh, security recipients, and uh, Medicare uh, recipients. That's 62.8. Add that all up, it's 133 billion. And what does that relate to? That 133 billion, when compared with the 385 billion that represents the state's portion of GDP, if you will, that's 34.5%. That is, in accounting terms, way beyond material. That's a huge, huge portion of our Virginia economy. Uh, we also have other measures, military facilities, uh, military replacement value, and the number of people uh, who work in our military facilities, uh, both civilian and, uh, and uh, uh, military. And then we have, particularly around Washington, but in other areas of the state as well, uh, 27.4 million square feet of uh, federal leased and owned buildings, and, and most of that is from lease. So again, on the national basis, it's 25.6% of state GDP. Again, in a remarkable dependency. Just take a look at the, uh, the right-hand column. Just, this is, just to quickly show you that uh, whatever Virginia is experiencing with its 27% of, uh, of our revenues from the federal government, look at what happens in those other states. And just for the heck of it, you might ask yourself, are those red states, are they blue states? Very interesting, I think, when you just think about that for a minute. The median and then Wyoming uh, has the smallest percentage. Uh, if you look at this dependency relative to the state's GDP, Again, you can see uh, a number of these states are extraordinarily uh, dependent in Delaware, the least so. When you look at military facilities, both by count and by military personnel, you'll see Virginia, very prominent in both of those uh, top five listings. 
And in terms of federal leased and owned buildings, uh, you have Virginia with the second largest. Okay. What does all this mean? Well, I've been predicting in public, uh, really in talks across this country uh, for the last five years or more, actually since 05, uh, that this is coming, this is coming, this is coming, and it's going to start hitting. And because in 2011 we had the Budget Control Act passed, it led to sequestering when uh, the ex there was not acceptance, regrettably, of Simpson Bowles' recommendations. And so what are we now experiencing? The shoe is dropped. Cuts are being made. The federal government is, is providing fewer funds. They didn't cut under sequester Social Security or Medicare. So all of the other ways in which you think about the federal government that's what's being affected, including grants to universities, unemployment insurance, et cetera. And so this was just a, a week or so ago, uh, front page of the Richmond Times Dispatch, state to cut 565 jobs, and in that article, the governor is quoted. He's noting that there's this uncertainty over sequestering in the federal budget. Um, I would say it's more than uncertainty, it's a certainty at this point, and we have the obligation to prepare Virginia. Well. I love our gardener, governor uh, uh, and the members of the General Assembly, but quite frankly, they should have been working more diligently and more rigorously on this ever since 2011 when they knew this was coming because we shouldn't be in a position today of having to lay off 565 people. We should have anticipated that uh, a couple of years ago and been planning for it. And this is a problem of not anticipating these cuts that's uh, affecting uh, most of our states. And then it's not just the states who suffer. You can see back in June when the notion of having to cut a couple billion dollars out of the biennial budget for Virginia started taking hold and uh, entered into discussion. We have local governments af afraid, very afraid, and actually now experiencing cuts to education and uh, the funding that the state provides. And this is the, the money that goes directly from the states. Uh, to, to these local governments. So we, we, the shoe has dropped. We're now into a period of retrenchment. I think we're going to be in it for decades. And uh, the question is, how are we going to get ourselves out of it? And I hope that's something you'll ask some questions about uh, when, we, uh, when we end. Okay? Thank you. In case anybody's wondering, uh, I printed out the 260 pages that we're talking about tonight. <laughs> uh, Scott obviously uh, uh, showed you the summary, but if anybody really wants to dig in, <laughs> that's what we're trying to figure out. Well, Scott had, uh, had led uh, his talk with the fact of a, of a quote and talking about being as clear as a merchant. And uh, that's a great lead in because uh, largely what I'd be talking about tonight is having put together an article on if the government was a corporation, what would it look like? What kind of metrics would we be looking at? And this all came about because for the last number of years have been on the editorial task force and said, hey, this would be a, a great topic. And everybody looked around and said, great, you can write it. <laughs> so uh, that's how I got involved. So being, trying to be a salesman for our company, our corporation, uh, I'll give you some facts, but being a CPA, I do have to lay out a few things. So as you're evaluating whether you'd like to really own shares in this corporation, I have to tell you, we consistently lose money every year. We project that this will continue indefinitely. We have large unfunded liabilities, both on and off our balance sheet. And I guess I should tell you that we payroll deduct for people's pension and their health care 
and we spend it because we, you know, things are tight, so we just need to spend those monies. And you shouldn't worry because we have an IOU in a box that says we're going to pay back these trust funds. Many people would, would acknowledge that our management and our board of directors are, quote, dysfunctional. So as that being a summary, uh, how many shares can I put you down for? <laughs> so getting into a little further, we have okay the uh, this from the GAO and I guess it's a, a pretty good summary the federal government continues to face an unsustainable long-term fiscal path uh, not my quote but right out of the statements so from the perspective of being where we're at it might surprise you, but two of the three major rating agencies have us as AAA rated. Now, some of these numbers are coming off of what uh, Scott and Ed have talked about. So, but what I've tried to do is, okay, we're a corporation. Where's the metric? What does a trillion dollars mean? So. Here, and I'll refer to the $805 billion loss because that's supposedly the accrual base loss as opposed to you know, lesser numbers that get shown because it's cash basis. And we've talked about the liabilities. I've added one thing that I'll uh, point out a little bit here. As you see, the additional unfunded liability for the alternative projection. Well, the trustees of the social programs do not believe the numbers that are recorded in the trustees report and they say that it is likely that that the estimates predominantly for Medicare will be exceeded and that amount is 8.9 trillion dollars. So let's take the most likely path. So we're at 73.3 trillion. Remember this is present value. So let's start looking at you see per person, just the loss alone of over 2,500. Well, I don't know how many five-year-olds can afford to pay to help fund the government, so let's look at per worker. But then you come into the situation, if somebody's working part-time, they're probably not, a lot, they're not gonna be able to pay a lot of money, so let's look at it per full-time worker. And even though not all of them are gonna have a lot of excess money, let's at least use that metric. So in the latest year that we've been looking at, it's over $6,800 per full-time worker. Now we start adding the liabilities. So when you get down to the amounts of total debt, and you know, including the alternative total debt, we're at $620,000 per full-time worker, present value. So effectively, barring some miracle, that number will go up every year. Now, how many people here feel like they could write a check to pay this off? Because it would be the present value. It's what you'd have to put on the side today to cover these expenditures for the next 75 years before you walk out the door to write a check for $620,000. And if your spouse works, one, one and a quarter million dollars. Uh, that's what we're facing. So trying to put this from the perspective of if we were a corporation, what would the metrics look like? Now, tried to highlight a little bit as far as the social programs. Now, if you look in the government reports, they're the, uh, they add an I on the end. I think it's a little more appropriate to call them the SOS programs uh, for some obvious reasons. But if you just separate these numbers out and just look at the Social Security, the Medicare, the various forms of Medicare, and I've added 4.8 trillion as far as what 
is owed to the trust funds uh, from uh, the rest of the government. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means $451,000 per full-time worker is the liability for the 53.4 trillion. Now that represents 73% of total liabilities, funded and un un unfunded, mostly unfunded. And I think what that clearly states is, I don't know what the answer is, but I know if you don't address 73% of your problem, you probably have not addressed the problem. And there needs to be a discussion about what we can afford, how we're gonna fund it, are people willing to pay taxes so that future generations will have their money, uh, how that can be segregated. But again, that's, that's a huge problem, but I think until you address 73% of, of your liability in your balance sheet, what have you done? We keep talking about the trust fund, and it's the $4.8 trillion. Now, just this week, we had a link from the VIA CPA, and it takes you to the AICPA Insights, and it says 19 years until a trust fund runs out. Well, I guess we don't have that much to worry about. So we've looked at the numbers, and you've seen several sheets up here uh, would surprise you to know as scott was kind of pointing out the financial statements of the government show a zero liability to the trust fund so is it really a trust fund does it really have 19 years before it runs out if there's no money in it I and mean, i think you really need to to look at the fact of looking what a trust fund is, if, if this were a corporation and the corporation took money out then, and you had it payroll deducted and it was for your retirement, you would expect that there was something invested there. And instead by law, it's put into special treasury notes that at some point somebody will have to do something with. They're non-negotiable. So that you're relying on the rest of the government to borrow more money to pay stuff that you put on the side for your retirement. Uh, certainly part of the liability is the promise from the government and part of it is what has already been withheld from your paycheck. But it's not at Vanguard or Fidelity or in stocks that might do better than the current interest rates. I uh, won't talk too much about the Department of Defense, but I think it does at least uh, merit some mention. Uh, I'd, far be it from me to know how much we should spend on defense. I would just say that if you take the top 10 spending nations on defense, we spend as much as the next nine combined. And if, if anybody's had the opportunity to read uh, Robert Gates' book, Duty, now he is former Secretary of Defense under two different presidents and uh, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And here's what he had to say about military budgets. He said, the military budgets are locked in for years to come, for years at a time, and all the bureaucratic wiles of each military department are dedicated to keeping those programs intact and funded. They are joined in those efforts by the companies that build the equipment, the Washington lobbyists that those companies hire, and the members of Congress in whose states or districts those factories are located. Any threats to those long-term programs are not welcome, even if we are at war. And basically the problem comes down to, uh, Ed's mentioned all the intergovernmental dependency. If somebody wants to cut back something at, in Fort Lee, you're gonna have your senators and congressmen from Virginia fighting to get it. And they're gonna have, if, if there are other cutbacks in other states, they're gonna be doing the same thing, gathering votes from other senators and congressmen. And you end up 
you know, as they talk about building tanks that the Army didn't ask for because they're in somebody's district and somebody had enough power to get a vote passed. So uh, again, it's not nearly as big as, as the uh, social programs, but it certainly would be addressed and it would be something that if, if there was uh, an independent look over what made sense for the nation as opposed to one jurisdiction over another, they could probably do some things. Now, you might wonder about the liquidity. If you are investing in a company and they have a debt maturity that's 10 years from now, you probably don't even give it a second thought. However, if the majority of their debt rolls over uh, in the next year, you might think hard and heavy, uh, what kind of financial condition are they in? Are they gonna be able to roll over the debt? So would it, it surprised the heck out of me. So let me ask you if it surprised you that last year where we were funding a roughly $600 billion cash deficit, we had to borrow $8.1 trillion. And that's because our, our, the term of our debt is getting shorter and shorter and it keeps having to get rolled over. So everybody's buying in those 10-year bonds and look at what you can do when you start financing your deficit at 25 basis points instead of paying 2.5% on a 10-year note. But what does it do to your liquidity and of course, what does it do to your interest rate risk? Now let's take a quick look. Here's, well, they changed dramatically in a week, but they're roughly where we are now. So short-term funding, 25 basis points, 10 years, 2.2 is maybe two and a quarter this morning. Now, what if I told you I saw a projection that next year, the Fed funds rate that's currently 25 basis points would go up one to one and a quarter 275 and 16 and 375 and 17. Now, if you started adding 3% to just even the 12 trillion that we currently have outstanding, you're at 360 billion in additional <clears throat> interest that would be paid. So are these <clears throat> estimates of where interest rates could be reasonable? Well, they come from the Federal Reserve. Here is the latest Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve actually, literally, each dot represents a voting member of the Federal Reserve. They will not tell you who voted, but if you look at it and you just look at the clusters, <clears throat> you would take in a year to about one and a quarter and two years to about two and three quarters and then to three and three quarters. So considering that the federal funds rate will will gravitate into a lot of other areas. Uh, you can start looking at increases in interest being a, a problem. Uh, just as a, make a quick point, the Fed, all of the Fed activities, the 4.3 trillion that they had at the end of the last fiscal year, uh, none of that is on any of the statements because they are considered an independent bank. So to kind of wrap things up, this was just passed, Medicare Part D was just passed in 2003 and effective in 2006. Would it have passed if you knew that it was a $6.9 trillion unfunded liability? Would it have passed if Congress said, we think this is a great program, we're now gonna tax every full-time worker $58,000 in present value dollars to pay for it? I don't think that would be a hard question to know what the answer would be. So I think when you start looking at the things and, 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 and trying to get to a corporation and hopefully um, as we talk about, as Amy talks further about dealing with the Senate Budget Committee and everything, there's too many things where we play games. You look at a program being passed, how could a program that costs seven trillion dollars get passed and not ever be disclosed as to what the liability is? And uh, things like that, and, and hopefully, if we start looking at it as a corporation, we might actually act like a corporation and address problems when we have them. Amy, I'll turn that over to you.
Okay, get set up here. Hello, good evening. Um, again, I'm Amy Edwards with the Senate Budget Committee. Um, I'm glad to be here with you this evening despite my fellow panelists' um, three presentations that were a bit of the gloom and doom <laughs> of what we're facing as, as, a, as a federal government. Um, but, um, you know, I, it is fortunate that uh, I do work for Senator Mark Warner, who um, may be the most obsessed senator about our deficit and debt issues and our, and our fiscal responsibility. Um, I think he's, he admits that he's a little rather self-obsessed with this. And if any of you know him, um, a lot of Virginians in the room, um, you know, every chance he gets in every forum he speaks to, he brings up the, the challenges that we're facing um, that were outlined by, by my, my fellow panelists. So this is something that, you know, he's focused on daily and I um, work with him on these issues. Um, you know, I, I'm sure all of you are aware that uh, last year we passed the Murray Ryan budget uh, which is holding off the sequester for a temporary period. Um, but, you know, some of these challenges are going to come back and we're going to ha I, mean, I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell you what's going to happen in Congress. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't. Uh, but I am here today to talk a little bit about some of the other work. Uh, while debt and deficit and the numbers are top of mind to Senator Warner, um, you know, we've been working on a number of other reforms across uh, Congress that will, I hope, help further this debate and have a better informed debate as we move forward. And that's what I want to talk with you all a little bit about today. Um, Senator Warner is the chairman of a government performance task force on the Senate Budget Committee. And he likes to joke that they gave him this task force to try to keep him busy and out of trouble. <laughs> so for the past, which obviously has not worked, but for the past five years, we've been working on trying to improve the information base for decision making uh, in Congress. Uh, the Budget Committee has that responsibility. Uh, we've been trying, you know, we've been examining what information is currently available. Beyond all of the numbers that my fellow panelists brought up today, if you want to dig, dig in deep to some of those numbers and find out what programs are supporting it, you know, where that money flows in the community, what contracts or grants are associated with that, it's very difficult to do. And the other piece of that is what do you get for those investments? What is the return? What are the, what's the performance? Are these programs and these investments, are they working? I mean, you know, as you're trying to address these fiscal challenges, you really gotta be able to answer some of those important questions as we do this hard work. And so that is what the task force that I helped Senator Warner with has been looking at. And at our very first hearing, um, we, we brought in from the Office of Management and Budget, their Chief Performance Officer, the Deputy Director for Management, and we said, hey, how are we doing? And <laughs> very clearly, if you read his quote here, He's describing our current performance management framework and how we manage our money across the government. And he's saying that Congress doesn't use it, agencies don't use it, and it doesn't produce meaningful information for the public. So that's where we started five years ago. And Senator Warner was obviously like, oh my God, what are we gonna do about this? And so we, we started by um, working on, uh, well, actually my slides are a little out of order here. Um, Another issue that we also, um, the Senator has been very focused on is around not only we don't know if things work, but then if you want to know how our programs are structured across the federal government, it gets even more confusing. For instance, we have 209 STEM programs across 13 federal agencies. What, how can that make sense? You know, <laughs> I mean, I think Congress and over time we add uh, programs and programs because some, you know, an issue is very important to us, but we never really take a step back and look at how many programs have accumulated, are they delivered efficiently and effectively, and how can we make them work better? How can we save money by doing that? And another example is uh, GAO does a report every year on duplication across the federal government, which we use a lot. DOD has, you know, they've pointed out in the most recent, DOD has uh, a, over a dozen satellite control networks and we're spending 13 billion on it. But if we bring them together and consolidate, we could save millions. So, I mean, I think we get, each year, tons of information about how we can do better. How, and so we are trying to act on a lot of this. Um, this is a rather complex chart here, but it does provide, um, in lack of spending information that we have right now, this is a, a little chart that GAO produced for us that actually has all the federal agencies. So you can see Department of Agriculture, Commerce, I don't know if you can all see this out there. And then up at the top are the budget functions. So if you look at the, the first category is defense, international affairs, this is how the budget committee prepares a budget um, each, each year when we work on it. And so we focus on these functions. 
but I thought it was very interesting and sort of drives home the, uh, the point around duplication and overlap. You know, agriculture has nine different budget functions supporting its work. So it's got international affairs, energy, natural resources, where we expect to see it. I mean, some of these agents, like Homeland Security, it's, it's got 10 different budget functions, you know, where it's drawing resources from. Um, so, you know, we, we have kind of a tangled, you know, system here, and how do we detangle it? How do we reorganize it to make it more efficient and more effective? So this is where we started with Senator Warner's task force, asking a lot of these questions. How do we get the data around some of knowing what works and knowing really specifically where the money is going? So in 2010, uh, we passed the bipartisan uh, update to the current, um, back in 1993, we passed the Government Performance and Results Act. That is the framework that no one was really using. So we passed an update to that, which required a pretty big overhaul and scaling back of some of the information being produced so we can get better priorities, better, more streamlined information, improve transparency. We aligned all of the performance reporting with the budget process so we can have the information when we need it. We, we did something really important in this legislation, which is create a federal inventory of programs, knowing what programs we have across the, the federal government, having a common definition of how we define a program. We had never gone down that path before, and so we think that's an important thing to help us figure out what we do in the future. Um, the website, if you want to look up some of this information, is performance.gov. Um, we're still doing a lot of oversight on this, you know, changing and changing the culture of the federal government to be more, more performance focused and report is something that's not going to happen overnight. So um, we continue to do a lot of oversight. We have another GAO report coming out soon on the program inventory, and this is something that we're, we do a lot of um, monitoring on. So that's, that's the one area that we, um, that we uh, have really been focused on. So the, the next part is on the finances. How do we know where our money's going in a more granular way? Um, I think we're going to the Data Act. In May of this year, I, we're very pleased that we passed the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. Uh, this is Senator Warner's bill, and his partner in the House on this bill was uh, Congressman Darrell Issa. So this is as bipartisan as you can get. <laughs> um, so. The Data Act does a few really important things. One, it sets government-wide standards. Right now, we don't have a common standard for all of the different reporting structures, which we'll get into in a few minutes. It requires that all federal funds be put on one website, and we can all track it in one, um, one single place. We have some efforts included to try to reduce recipient reporting, which is something we've heard a lot about. And then we have a component in the bill that's focused on data analytics. So this one, I thought it would go into a little bit more detail since it's a, it's a newer piece of legislation that just was uh, passed this year. Um, by way of background, uh, the Data Act updates a bill that was passed in 2006 that was in a, a Senator Coburn and Obama bill, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, and that created the website usaspending.gov. I don't know if anybody has ever checked out, you probably pulled some of your data from it. Um, it's a portal that's su supposed to supply information on all contracts and grants and loans across the federal government. But if you don't have common government-wide standards for some of that reporting, there's a lot of data quality and integrity issues that we've observed that were a pretty big concern of ours moving into the Data Act. Um, so here's USA Spending. So you can see, I pulled up Virginia. This is just, you can go online, you can go online and do this now and you can see some of this information that's there. One of the things that we spent quite a bit of time looking at when we were trying to figure out, well, how do we get information organized in a way that makes sense? Well, we looked a lot at what happened with the Recovery Act. You guys may have been involved with some of the reporting associated with the Recovery Act, but one of the key management lessons I think that we took away from it was that we need these standards. I mean, the, the, the recovery.gov uh, experience, you know, created government-wide standards and created a whole new regime of reporting that we didn't including the Data Act uh, from, from the recipients of federal funds. Um, but we did definitely follow and track what was going on with, with recovery because it did provide an enhanced level of transparency that I think is very, was very helpful at least and produced uh, a lot of um, uh, you know, support in reducing the fraud and uh, other waste that could have been associated with these funds. So as I mentioned, the Data Act is trying to create these data standards, and the information is coming from several streams. So it's coming from Scott's accounting world, and all of the information coming in through the federal agencies' accounting systems. 
It's taking all the, all the uh, information that would normally flow to OMB in the budget. It's taking the information that would, the procurement data that would go to the General Services Administration. And it's also bringing in all the grant data into one common standard so we can track it all consistently. This is just some background. I'm gonna move a little faster so we can get to the discussion. Um, just on the bill, it was enacted on May 9th of 2014. This is uh, talking a little bit about sort of the government-wide standards. We're Scott's colleagues at Treasury are working closely with OMB right now to develop those standards. So uh, I don't know if some of you, they had a town hall recently where they shared some of that information. I know some state and local governments were involved in that and they're required to be consulting with state and local governments as they, they develop those standards. Um, and just some other, um, the big debate we had about government-wide unique identifiers. So um, making sure that every Every uh, contract has unique identifying number on it. So a lot of sort of structural issues just to make sure that we can track funds the way that we would want to. Full disclosure of funds. So we dictated in the law that agency, that we, we're going to be able to sort by a couple different ways, by appropriations account, but also by program activity. And we tried to mirror as many of the existing categories of spending that, that's out there now so that we hopefully will have as little disruption uh, to the federal uh, existing financial management systems that are out there. So reducing recipient reporting, um, that's one of those things that might be of interest to this group in particular. Um, one of the things we heard about with the Recovery Act was that you know there was a lot of new reporting burden put on state and local governments or, or contractors or anyone who received those funds. So um, we didn't require any new reporting with this legislation, but what we do want to look at and what we included in here is a pilot program that as we create these standards across the federal government, how could they be applied to the reporting that happens at the state and local level? So, you know, can they, you know, so if you're reporting to agriculture and you're reporting to the Department of Defense, are they using the same financial terminology? And we hope that those, those same standards could be applied, but OMB is looking into that issue and will report back to us on how that goes. A um, little bit on, on the Data Act for implementation. It's going to be over the next few years. We should have standards in another, you know, eight months or so. The agencies have a couple years to start using them, and then the information is first uh, published in May of 2017. And that's, that's where I'll stop, because I know we want to get to the discussion, but there's a lot of activity, you know, focused on the Budget Committee and elsewhere in Congress, all very bipartisan. This is a piece of how we address and be more fiscally responsible, and there is some good bipartisan work being done here. So I um, look forward to talking more with the panel. I'm going to ask the uh, panelists to resume their seats up on the stage. And let's see. Oops, sorry. Everybody at work would be so proud of me for knowing how to do PowerPoint. So, uh, um, I thought these were great presentations. I hope you all got a lot of information out of this. Uh, I want to. I think we're going to sort of cut some of the structured discussion because I think your questions would be very, very helpful at this point. Though I do want to kick things off. Uh, at Pew, we're very big into educating our, our constituents, uh, policymakers. Um, when I first started working in the federal budget, I worked for Paul Songus, who used to say, the numbers are relentless. And um, all of you discussed a discussion on these issues. Um, so I want to start off. We have a very sophisticated audience. They get net present value. They get the, the dis a sophisticated discussion on numbers. But do average Americans get it? And do we need to spend more time talking to them and, and specifically then to policymakers? So Scott, you, you, Treasury makes this citizen's guide to make the process more understandable. Does it, does it work? Uh, I would say that, okay. I would say that uh, yes it does. I, I sometimes refer to myself as the filler brush man of uh, the federal <laughs> financial management community uh, or selling Amway. Um, it's a bit of a grassroots effort, but uh, a lot of uh, positive feedback that we have gotten and a lot of traction that we have gotten on the financial report and particularly the Citizen's Guide uh, is in the education community. Um, routinely there's dozens, uh, 
uh, about dozens of universities that have incorporated the Citizen's Guide into their uh, curriculum, be it either as a, my appearing as a guest lecturer, or I refer, to, sometimes I refer to, I have some colleagues that I refer to as the Financial Report Ambassadors, who actually have taken this document and made it part of their, uh, uh, their um, class program, classroom programming. Uh, we have made a number of outreach, uh, outreach efforts. We, we have a very large outreach effort, actually, at, within Treasury to try to, we extend out to the international community. Uh, actually, we've had some, a lot of, uh, a tremendous reaction from the international community, particularly on the candor with which we speak about some of these issues. True to Tom's point, uh, social insurance uh, does not appear in the, on the balance sheet, but we still, again, as I mentioned, uh, discuss it as a significant exposure. And I have spoken to a number of uh, international audiences, and they simply can't believe the information that we put in this report and say in black and white. For us to come out and say that the government is currently on a fiscally unsustainable path nearly literally blows uh, a lot of people's minds. Excuse me. To your point, uh, uh, the, the notion of net present value, understandably, uh, not exactly the easiest concept to get. We try to write the Citizen's Guide for roughly a college level audience. Um, but that does not mean that we don't try to reach out to other audiences uh, beyond that. Uh, we think that the, that's why it's called the Citizen's Guide, not the College Educated Citizen's Guide. Uh, while there are some complex uh, concepts in here, uh, we think there's some pretty basic information that uh, would resonate with every citizen. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. We to be, did you, Ed? No, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to be very selfish and ask one, pr one question because uh, I thought Ed's discussion of Virginia and how dependent Virginia is on federal funds, we we've, we've see it in the current debate in Richmond. Um, do you, are states looking into their dependence on, on, on federal funds and, and what are states doing to, to sort of manage against that for their long-term fiscal health? I regret to say that I think the bulk of the states uh, have waited for the shoe to start, start dropping. And that's, that's been a great disappointment to me. And without going to inside baseball, I think the problem is that the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, on which I sat for 10 years, has failed to require states and local governments to report this degree of interdependency. My hope, sort of picking up on, on, the, on what Scott just said, is that the governors at least some portion of the governors around the country would get together their best minds to look at this issue of dependency and to go back to the Congress, their representatives in the Congress, and to the Congress as a whole and say, look, we can't survive as a nation with these trends. Here are areas that we would sacrifice the receipt of federal funds looking not just at the grants and contracts, but all of those flows that I suggested happen. I think if those governors put together advisory committees made of, up of folks from citizenry, from local governments, from education institutions, for businesses and so forth, so that that comprehension of what is in Scott's report, analyzed by what I've done, could, could really hit home then I think we could all expect our citizens to be willing to share a different outlook and a different burden. Well, great. Let me, let me ask, does anybody in the audience have a specific question they'd like to ask the panel? I got a question for Amy. Yep. Um, Amy could you speak up loudly? Thank you. Amy, it sounds like uh, your boss gets it. I'm just going to restate it so that we capture it on the video. The question is, do members of Congress get this? Well, I, I, I don't know that I can speak for all members of Congress. <laughs> but I can say that this is, you know, 
what we actively debate on the budget committee, you know, at every hearing. This is what we discuss. This is what, so the members that we will actively work with are very much informed about this and, and, and the challenges we're facing. And, and, you know, the hard part is getting the bipartisan agreement on how we move forward. And, um, you know, these issues will be coming back when we reconvene uh, next month. Um, and and I, I, I don't, I mean, but are they informed? I think they're, pre I mean, on the facts that are, you know, the basic facts and the challenges we face, I mean, I think, you know, most of them are the, the guy I work for uh, is definitely informed. I think you probably could have given this in one of these presentations because he's um, very much, you know, aware of how it impacts states as a former governor. You know, he just naturally sort of goes to that place and is very concerned about, especially Virginia. Um, but so does, you know, others who are actively involved, whether you're on their budget committee or the appropriations committee. I mean, I think this is an actively, I mean, everyone's debating this. So, so yes, thankfully, I think most folks are, are pretty informed. Amy, can I ask you a question? Uh, this is a process-related question. We often hear with uh, continuing resolution after continuing resolution that there's uncertainty mm -hmm. that comes as a result of that. Uh, and certainly not speaking for your boss or anything, just um, is, is there a better process? Or does the budget, <laughs> is the budget committee looking at any budget process changes that might make that a more predictable budget process for Congress? I mean, there certainly have been a lot of proposals um, made in Congress mm -hmm. to kind of look at how we could work more effectively. Um, there have been discussions around moving to a two-year budget cycle. Um, there's a budget cycle or an appropriation cycle. That's a very different debate. Um, so, I mean, there's those topics have been discussed. I mean, I don't know if, if we could see any of those in the near term, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but certainly those ideas have been presented on how to be, you know, more effective. Yeah. Let me see. Does anybody have another question? On your dedicated group here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, my question is, is really more on a much lower level. Um, running a nonprofit, we are, of course, um, reliant on federal grants. And in long range planning, if what I'm hearing is correct, I shouldn't be relying on those long term grants. Um, however, So I'm going to try and summarize that just for the video. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of grants or appropriations, are, are they are they going to get squeezed out because we're not addressing some of these issues now? And if there there isn't a rush to sort of tackle these issues, are we going to see things like grants to nonprofits start to go away? Let me try to answer that at least in part. The uh, Budget Control Act and, and the sequestering legislation uh, basically took approximately half of the budget, not that portion that deals with social insurance, but all the other things that produce grants and uh, all of the State Department, Defense Department, all of those activities. And it said, we're going to take half of the money, it's like 2.1 trillion out in 10 years, and we're going to take half of it from defense. So if you get anything at a university or wherever that relates to defense, or if you are a business person who take some revenue with defense contracts, you can absolutely assume that, that you're going to suffer uh, some, some losses as a general case. Um, and, uh, and, and the other part of the sequester, which I particularly found very troublesome, was the fact that it cut things across the board. There have been a couple of areas, as Amy alluded to, that there were exceptions made after people really screamed about it, but it's across the board. So instead of cutting out the, uh, the military equipment that the Defense Department has formally said, we don't want, <laughs> no, they can't do that. They, everything's cut across the board. So to the degree that the major sources of your funding are part of those cuts, and, and there are ways you can go back and, 
and uh, pin down uh, that information in your federal supplying agencies, you're going to suffer losses. And so will everybody else. It, it, very inefficient. Let me just say, if I may, people, our founding fathers, I've said this in many talks, our founding fathers would be horrified, I believe, with what's going on today. The last 40 years, the Congress of the United States, not the presidents, and we've had presidents of all parties, and I've gotten to be very empathetic towards all of them, whether they be Republican or Democrat, Bush or Obama or however. It's the Congress that sets the laws. It's the Congress that makes the budget and the appropriation. It's the Congress that, that causes these inefficiencies and duplications by the way they work. I think there was a tremendous switch somewhere that went off in the wrong direction uh, in the mid-60s when uh, the President and the Congress found that they could borrow from the trust funds. Uh, and uh, the economist, who again I have a crossed hair about, who uh, constantly said, well, so long as it's a certain percentage of GDP, don't worry about it. No, they, they were all wrong. And the shame of it is, in my view, is that had we held ourselves to be fiscal responsibility, responsible, uh, we all, all of us in this audience on this stage, would still consider ourselves among the wealthiest and, and most prosperous people on the face of the earth. We did not have to get into this situation. The Congress caused it, and the Congress does not appear to be solving it in the short term. That's why I believe I put my money on the governors someday waking up and exerting leadership, I hope. Yes, ma'am, in the back. So I'm going to try and summarize that. So what if we took a haircut right now and balanced the budget? What would be some of the economic consequences? And, and is that something that's a good thing for us right now? Uh, I think you need to look at the big picture. And to, to, to uh, take the risk of sounding uh, uh, a, a bit like uh, uh, Everett Dirksen, a trillion here and a trillion there, before you know it starts to add up some real money. And of course he was talking about billions, but now it's trillions. And yes, we absolutely need to have some kind of grand bargain, whatever it is, whatever the structure is, because that will tide us over for a certain amount. But there's nobody looking at what is the big picture. Okay, we, it, it came up, uh, Ed mentioned uh, the disability trust fund. In two years it will be cut to 81 percent of benefits. Is there a single person here that believes we'll only pay 81 percent of benefits? We know whether the money's there or not, as things stand, we'll, Congress will allocate some funds someplace. But it's kicking the can down the road. The, the problem is nobody wants to deal with it. What happens when the furor that we had when we simply wanted to change to a chained CPI calculation for Social Security. I mean, the AARP was out in arms. You know, they were going to have demonstrations in Washington. My God, how could you have a uh, cost of living adjustment that actually reflects what seniors are experiencing rather than something that will give them more? So if we can't change something that maybe they get 1% instead of 1.7%, where's the big picture when we run out with the ability to give any check? Because the ability to give any check is, is based on our ability. You mentioned that 
okay, on average, people are spending 125% of what they make. Well, the government's been doing that year after year after year. And, you know, we have uh, situations where uh, everybody's heard about the dock fix, where each year they argue about it and then they approve the dock fix. Otherwise, uh, doctors will get 19% less for Medicare patients. Well, why did they do it for one year? Because if they did it permanently, they'd have to count the next 10 years of what it would cost instead of one year because the law now assumes that, okay, for nine years after we approve this, we're not gonna take care of it. So we, we are structurally broken. There's no way around it. There, that you, you, somebody needs to take a look at the big picture and say, okay, here are the big issues is anybody willing to talk about Social Security, Medicare without calling each other names and just recognize, okay, this is a problem. Let's try to come up with some reasonable solution. You know, I just try to think of, of, of problems and I hear from a lot of people and they say, well, you know, eventually it doesn't matter how much debt we have, we'll inflate our way out. Uh, the reason I put the charts in there about the liquidity and the interest rates if you have a lot of 10, 20, 30 year debt and you start inflating your way out by creating inflation and paying back with cheaper dollars, that can work. But if all your debt's short term, all, you've, all you're doing is you're, you're paying more and more in interest and you can't inflate your way out. So that's not a solution. I don't know the answer. I, you know, I wish I did. <laughs> I don't know that anybody has the answer, but I think in order for us to move forward, we have to think big picture and be able to sit down across the table, whether it's Republican, Democrat, independent, libertarian, it doesn't matter. There needs to be a legitimate discussion about each of the issues and how to deal with it. And yes, we need to look at the trillion here and trillion there, but we also need to look at the 50, 60, 70 trillion dollar questions and figure out how we're going to pay it. Yeah, I'd really recommend Scott's, uh, the charts that he, he's provided, looking at some of the long-term uh, cost drivers in terms of Social Security, Medicare, some of these demographic-based programs compared to discretionary spending, and some of the impacts that we saw here in the Commonwealth related to sequestration versus some of these programmatic mandatory programs. This, the scale is, is, is pretty significant. Does anybody else have and, another and question? Jeff, if I could follow up on one thing. Did anybody notice what Ed said about sequestration? It exempted Social Security and Medicare. So the biggest problems we have were exempted from the across the board cuts. Yes, ma'am. I believe we have a question back there, and then, sir, you'll be next. Yeah, I agree completely. The Social Security form, we've needed it for years. We need tax reform. We're probably not going to see it or get it. Uh, we need to continue to reduce waste and fraud in the government. I think we all know what needs to happen. What can we as citizens do? I mean, we know what needs to happen at the government level, but what can the average American do? So the question is, what can the average American do to affect change in this area? Vote smart. No, vote, vote for somebody. You have to vote for somebody who has a will and an interest to govern, who is willing to take risk, who is willing to teach, who is willing to share information and not hide behind uh, sound bites. And, and let me, I want to pick up on one little thing you said, because it, it, in this election period you hear fraud, waste, and abuse, it, probably less than I've heard in past elections. Uh, I've sat on two audit committees for two federal agencies. I, I was controller at OFFM. I got to tell you, the men and women who run these agencies are some of the brightest, sharpest, and most hardworking people I've ever met in my life. They can tell you almost to the dime what isn't working, what they would get rid of in a heartbeat if they could. But they will also tell you that if they try to do that, or if it's put forward in the president's legislation, and I don't care whether it's Bush or, Bush or Obama, the Congress will stamp it down. That's why you have all of this horrible duplication. Yes, the government is inefficient, but it's not I mean, I mean, there are issues of occasional fraud, but it, all of that has been pushed down 
a lot by the improved financial management and auditing and so forth. It's the Congress, it's the Congress, it's the Congress. I'll, um, if I may, I'll, I'll take it a step further. I brought 75 of these, I think, tonight, 70 some odd, and I think there's roughly 30, so there's enough for everyone to take a couple with them. I mean, that is, your question speaks right to why we do a document like this. To Ed's point, become knowledgeable and cognizant of the issues that we talk about in here and about the issues that we've talked about uh, at the panel this morning. Go, go back and talk with your friends, educate your family. If you have college age kids, if you have high school age kids, I speak to high school students as well. They eat this stuff up. And they ask very, they ask very poignant questions. We are, we are providing you all uh, uh, substance and opportunity to have the dialogue, to start the dialogue. And as Ed said, to, to, to vote, to ask the questions, to have the discussion. That's, that's why you're all here and that's why we're here. Hey, you all are leaders in your profession and your communities, so Amy, well, I'm sorry. So Congress is, you know, <laughs> in the hot seat here. Um, I, I think it would be, I, I should mention, you know, that um, this is something that has been very important to Senator Warner, and he, you know, has been willing to put everything on the table, and he has been willing to try unconventional ways of getting there through gang activity and bringing people together by, in a bipartisan way to, to look at these issues and be honest and get the facts and trying to work there. And in fact, you mentioned the president's budget every year has a volume of information that, in, that includes things that could be eliminated. In our first year uh, that I worked with him on the budget committee, we took 19 programs that were on President Obama's list to terminate that were also on President Bush's um, list to terminate. And we brought those forward and you know, we didn't get much success. But there are efforts and there are a lot of efforts uh, across Congress that are trying to do the right thing. And I think um, you all supporting those efforts and being vocal about them is, is very important. And, and being I, informed, as Scott said, is If really I may important. say, to me, that demonstrates, uh, I mean, I, that demonstrates the will to govern. And, and that will, willingness not just to make tough decisions, but to try to bring the citizenry along with you. And uh, you're right. Uh, the, how many times have we heard a budget go up, whether it was from Bush or Obama or, or Clinton or whoever, and, and somebody in, in uh, leadership, the Congress will say, dead on arrival. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can I add one little, just sure. quickly. I had something that I participated in, I think it was in June of 2010, that I would hold out to you as, as a bit of hope and, and positive thinking. Uh, an organization that sadly does not exist uh, today called America Speaks uh, under the leadership of then, I think it was David Walker and, uh, uh, and, uh, and some other notable folks. They had, they brought together about 2,000 people electronically in about 20 different locations across the country. They spent a beautiful uh, Saturday all day, eight hours, I was in with about 80 people in, in the Richmond uh, State Capitol. And they went through a prep session with much the same information as you've seen today. And then they were posed a series of questions, choices, if you will, in Social Security, in Medicare, in defense, in all of the areas of the government. And I watched tables of eight to 10 people clearly with, di with different incoming political persuasions, here and there. And they sat there, and that group of 2,000 people across this country, all who were linked electronically, came up with something like $2.2 trillion worth of change, both on, on expenditures and on revenues of over a 10-year period. And they did it without a punch being thrown and a nasty comment not being made. I think it can be done. So I'm, I'm going to be judicious with your time. You know, we have one more question from the gentleman in the front. Um, just to remind you all, we have a reception afterwards. So if you have any other questions, I hope our panelists will be kind enough to stick around for a few minutes and, and answer some of those questions. So sir, if we can have your last question.
Absolutely. Well, I, th I think, you know, you talk about what you can do. If there were a way to convince, or to, to request everyone to have a one, two-page summary and discuss it with their kids, their grandkids, based on the age, and see whether they would feel comfortable enough to inform their child or a neighbor's child or whatever of how much debt they have leap, uh, have pushed upon them that is coming. And if everyone was forced to have that conversation with somebody that they've nurtured, that they've brought up, that they've given all these things, that they might have put through college, and then said, well, we did all this stuff for you, but I need to be honest with you, and here's what you're going to be left with. And it's going to be your problem because nobody in my generation is willing to tackle it. You know, when I speak to high school and college students, uh, it always kind of really excites me because I get some of the same questions about what can I do as a college student or high school student. I think to myself, of the hundreds of students that I've spoken to, maybe a couple of those are going to be running for Congress someday or running for you know, to be a senator someday. Um, one quick additional point. If you pick these up, one or two or three copies on your way out, uh, there is a website. You don't have to come up and get copies of the full thing, full report from Tom. Uh, there is a website. It's listed on the bottom of the back page. Actually, I think it's listed on the bottom of every page. Uh, and at that site, you can view the full report. You can view the Citizen's Guide. There's an HTML version of the report so that you, it's a little interactive. It'll take you to links to kind of some additional resources you can see, the trustees report that Tom referenced. <clears throat> and there's links to the individual agency reports that can that kind of all get rolled up into this document. So uh, does anyone here have a Facebook account? No one has a Facebook account? <laughs> Twitter? <laughs> Social media is very powerful. Yeah. I'll just leave you with that. In the same plug, there's a, a pocket size piece with various reports and publications that some of my colleagues and I have produced, including our most recent report of intergovernmental dependency key measures. And you're welcome to take a look at that. It's got links that you can use if you want more information about it. Well, we've had a great discussion tonight. I hope we can continue it um, just outside the room. So if we could give our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you all very much.